So, uh, given that our next panel, uh, we have some of our distinguished speakers already here with us, but the moderator is online. He sits in Washington, uh, D.C., uh, Nikos Chafos. Uh, he will be moderating the panel virtually. So I will give the floor to, to Nikos to, to call on our uh, distinguished speakers. Nikos, glad to see you. Well. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kosta. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for having me. And uh, my name is Nikos Tsafos. I'm the James Lester Chair for Energy and Geopolitics here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington. And uh, uh, no one is sadder than I that I cannot be uh, there in Greece uh, with you uh, sitting around the room. But I, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to participate even remotely. Um, our last session for the day is going to talk about energy security issues in the Eastern Mediterranean, and there are plenty of those to talk about. So I'm really excited for the distinguished panel that we have assembled uh, for us today. We have obviously the U.S. Ambassador to the Hellenic Republic, uh, Jeff Pyatt, uh, who's going to kick off our discussion with a keynote address. We have uh, Dick Morningstar from the Atlantic Council, a former ambassador of the United States to uh, Azerbaijan and to the EU on the digital front. Uh, we have uh, Samuel Fulfari, a professor of the geopolitics of energy at the Free University of Brussels. We have Aristofani Stefatos, the CEO of the Hellenic Hydrocarbon Resource Management. And finally, we have uh, Lucian Pugliaresi, the president of the Energy Policy Research Foundation. So an excellent, excellent panel uh, of, uh, of discussions for us uh, this afternoon. So I will begin by uh, passing uh, the baton back to uh, Ambassador Payet uh, to share some of his thoughts. Obviously, the United States, a very active uh, participation in the energy and energy security questions of our region. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, passing on the floor to you. Welcome. Great. Thank you very much, Nikos. Um, Secretary General Sudoku, thank you for joining today. It's a real honor to be addressing you and my, my fellow panelists, colleagues, and friends. And I want to say a special thank you to the Hellenic Association for Energy Economics for inviting me back. I think this is my fifth symposium, so I'll try to say something new. And uh, But I also very much appreciate the platform that you provide to address some of these important issues. The theme of this year's event looking ahead with optimism is really a perfect description of how I view the changing energy landscape in Greece and in the Eastern Mediterranean. Energy cooperation continues to be one of the real bright spots in the U.S.-Greece relationship. Just looking at the past year, we can easily point to progress on several major energy projects like TAP, the IGB, the Alexandropoli FSRU, we're also seeing increasing U.S. investments in Greece in renewable energy, in battery storage, in e-mobility. These are all long-term strategic investments whose benefits haven't changed because of COVID-19. And as we continue to develop our robust energy policy relationship, we also, of course, need to factor in the climate crisis, something that I think all of us who live through Last summer in Athens, the terrible fires outside of the city in Evia in ancient Olympia need no convincing of. The Biden-Harris administration, of course, has placed the climate challenge and clean energy transition at the forefront of U.S. international energy policy. President Biden, my boss, Secretary of State Blinken, the president's climate envoy, my former boss, uh, Secretary John Kerry, and Secretary of Energy Granholm have made clear that climate change is the challenge of our age. It's also an opportunity to make historic advancements in global prosperity and the quality of life. As we emphasized at the Department of Energy's Partnership for Transatlantic Energy and Climate Cooperation Summit in Warsaw last week, we are setting new goals for bold but achievable leaps in next generation technologies, including hydrogen, carbon capture, industrial fuels, and energy storage. And the United States is working with our partners around the world, and especially in this transatlantic community, to raise our collective ambitions, create jobs for millions of people, and protect the planet. Last week in Warsaw, Minister Skrekas 
had the first of many upcoming cabinet level meetings between the Biden-Harris administration and the Mitsotakis government, where Secretary Granholm underscored Greece's critical role as an energy partner for the United States. In particular, Prime Minister Mitsotakis' decision to retire all lignite power plants by 2028, if not 2025, and his plan to target a significant portion of Greece's 32 billion EU recovery funds towards clean energy, as Secretary General Sudoku dem discussed, demonstrates Greece's clear leadership in this area. Natural gas has also enabled Greece and its neighbors to reduce their emissions and accelerate the retirement of lignite power. When completed, the new Mytilineos natural gas-fired power station in Agios Nikolaos will be one of the largest and most efficient in Europe, featuring cutting-edge GE gas turbines that will significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions compared with lignite power plants. These high-efficiency GE gas turbines will also be the heart of the planned Alexandropoli natural gas power plant that will be co-owned by North Macedonia. As countries around this region transition to cleaner energy sources, Greece is also positioned to be among Europe's major generators of wind and solar power. I know that Minister Skreka, Secretary General Suduku, and their teams are hard at work on additional renewable energy sector reforms, as well as frameworks for critical areas like offshore wind and energy storage. These are technologies where U.S. companies lead, and the embassy is committed to facilitating U.S. investment. I'm proud that the American footprint in Greece's green energy sector is growing with companies like 547 Energy, Fortress Investment Group, Amoresco, Invenergy, and Jasper Energy, bringing U.S. investment funds and U.S. technologies to the Greek market. Growth in the green energy sector benefits both of our countries. For example, there's a Greek-American company, Advent Technologies, headquartered in Boston with offices in Patras, that's researching the next generation of fuel cell technologies. It's been a real privilege during my time here in Greece to watch Advent expand from a scrappy startup to being a NASDAQ-listed growing player in the international energy technology space. I was also glad to meet last summer with the CEO of Sunlight, which has an impressive large production facility in Xanthi and has also now launched a battery assembly facility in North Carolina. Sunlight joins other Greek companies like Raycap and Drama, which in addition to supporting energy transition here in Greece, are creating jobs and economic opportunity in the United States. We have arrived at a moment in which American and Greek perspectives and interests in the Eastern Mediterranean and Western Balkans are more aligned than ever before. And the growth in our bilateral energy relationship naturally translates into benefits for the wider region where we share a common vision for advancing peace, stability, and prosperity. A few weeks ago in Thessaloniki, we demonstrated how much we value this regional element of energy cooperation with visits from my good friends and fellow ambassadors from Sofia, Tirana, and Skopje, as well as the State Department's lead for energy issues to meet with Minister Skrekas, Deputy Minister Fragoyanis, and leading Greek energy companies. This ongoing engagement and cooperation is important because energy diversification, transition, and strategy are core issues that will define our country's economic growth and security for decades to come. Ensuring a secure energy supply is one of the pillars of the Biden-Harris administration's international energy policy. That's why Secretary of State Blinken appointed Amos Hochstein to serve as the State Department's Senior Advisor for Energy Security. Amos is a longtime friend and friend of Greece, and he recognizes the critical role that Athens can play in ensuring energy security for Eastern Europe. And as Special Envoy Hochstein has pointed out, spot gases in, are reaching all-time highs and there's a real risk now that parts of Europe will not have enough gas for the winter as supplies from Russia are inexplicably low compared to previous years 
and what Russia has the capacity to provide. Greece, with TAP and the Rebethusa terminal, terminal, is part of the solution to this challenge. In the Western Balkans, Greece has rapidly normalized relations with its northern neighbors through the Prespice Agreement. Greece and the Balkan countries are now collaborating on energy security and diversification, working to break Russia's gas monopoly with joint investment in projects like the Alexandropoli FSRU and IGB. And I'm very glad that gas transmission operators in Greece and the region are looking at how to leverage existing networks like the Trans-Balkan Pipeline to deliver gas to markets as far north as Ukraine and Moldova. This would further reduce Gazprom's monopoly power and Russia's political leverage over Eastern Europe. We strongly believe, as Minister Dendius and other Greek leaders have emphasized, that energy management should be an avenue for cooperation, not conflict. That's why the United States strongly supports Greece's efforts to deepen its ties with Israel and Cyprus through the 3 plus 1 framework. We were proud to host the 3 plus 1 Technical Working Group on Renewable Energy, where we're discussing how we can do more together in areas such as hydrogen technology and cybersecurity for infrastructure. Our initial energy cooperation in the 3 plus 1 framework is now expanding to new domains like technology and partnership on proactive fire strategy and prevention following the de devastating wildfires this summer. Collaborative arrangements like the 3 plus 1 initiative and the East Med Gas Forum reinforce stability and prosperity in this region. That's why we're also helping Greece build connections along a north-south axis through its participation in the Three Seas Initiative, which promises to further integrate the region with Europe's energy and communication networks. In addition to the Three Plus One, Three Seas, and other fora, Greece's growing cooperation with Egypt is important to promoting greater economic integration and stability in the East Med. Greece can increase further its role as a regional energy hub through its proposed natural gas and electricity linkages with Egypt, which will also facilitate greater penetration of renewable energy and the diversification of energy sources in southeastern Europe. President Biden has underscored the United States' commitment to the transatlantic relationship and the U.S.-Greece relationship as we together face today's global challenges from climate change to the pandemic and threats to regional energy security and political stability. That's why the United States is so dedicated to strengthening and deepening our ties with Greece, which are stronger now than ever before, and bolstering Greece's role as an energy hub and leader in the Eastern Mediterranean and Balkans. Building on the 200-year friendship between our countries, of which our robust energy partnership is a key dynamic facet we're working together to realize a shared vision of a stable and secure future for this region. Evharistopoli. But let me uh, turn first to uh, Ambassador Morningstar um, uh, Ambassador Morningstar, you know, we I wanted to build on some of the remarks that Ambassador Pyatt made. We've seen just a number of transformational projects uh, come online in the region recently, TANAP, TAP, Turk Stream even, and a number of projects that are being completed as we speak. You know, with your long engagement in the energy security questions of the region, you know, how would you characterize the energy security environment? How has it changed? And more importantly, what's next? on the energy security agenda from your perspective? Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Nikos. It's uh, good to see you virtually, as well as uh, uh, my former colleague and good friend, Ambassador Pyatt. Uh, and I'll try not to repeat what Ambassador Pyatt said, but I certainly agree uh, with everything that he did say. Uh, and also to thank uh, HAEE for inviting me I believe again uh, for this year's uh, uh, this year's program. Uh, last year, uh, because of the pandemic, uh, the economic downturn, uh, and the reduction in demand, I was recommending basically a pause 
on Eastern Mediterranean projects uh, and to focus on resolving the geopolitical issues uh, to be ready uh, for more investment uh, as things uh, as things perked up. There really have been major changes uh, in uh, the last year. Uh, the gas shortages uh, and high prices uh, uh, that uh, uh, that Ambassador Pyatt mentioned, uh, uh, not just in Europe, by the way, but in uh, Asia uh, as well and globally, uh, and also the increased emphasis uh, on the energy transition, uh, both in the United States uh, and the EU. Um, you know, we'll see if the tightness uh, in the gas market uh, continues. Um, but at the same time, I think there's an increased uh, recognition uh, that gas uh, and the need for decarbonized gas will continue uh, to be critical to the energy transition. Um, it, we, we can't ignore gas. We have to work to make gas uh, more environmentally compatible, but it's going to continue to be important. Uh, renewables, obviously also important, the projects in Greece that are being talked about, but that alone isn't going to solve the problem. Uh, gas is going to have to be part of uh, the energy transition. And I think Greece, uh, as the ambassador pointed out, is really in a good position uh, to, take, uh, to take advantage of these changes. Uh, it can be a hub for gas going into the Balkans and on, to, on into Europe through existing pipelines, as, as, as you mentioned, Nikos, uh, uh, TANAP uh, and TAP. Uh, as well as LNG uh, imports and the importance of the terminals at Alexandropolis and Revithusa. Uh, the uh, Greece, uh, uh, the IGB, the Greece Bulgaria interconnector, possibly an ionic Adriatic pipeline hooking up uh, with uh, uh, facilities, uh, even the Kirk terminal and, uh, and on into the Balkans. Uh, Greece is also obviously a source for renewable en energy. The ambassador mentioned the three C's initiative. I think it's really important that, uh, uh, that uh, Greece be involved. But there are risks. There continue to be risks, and I think it's important to per, uh, point, it out, point them out. Turk Stream is a risk uh, with respect to gas coming into the Balkans uh, and uh, creating a, a tougher, much tougher market in the Balkans. Um, and I think that it's important that Greece take uh, every step to make sure uh, that Turk Stream uh, is compatible uh, with the EU's third energy package and all, uh, and, and all EU uh, regulations. The Eastern Mediterranean continues to be a conundrum. Uh, as long as there are geopolitical issues uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean, development is going to be slow. Uh, Yes, Egypt is going to be tremendously important in Greek-Egyptian cooperation, both with respect to gas and uh, uh, new technologies, uh, is going to be important. But right now, really, the gas in the eastern Mediterranean is going to flow through Egypt. And really, uh, no, right now, I can't predict uh, when it will go through other, other uh, uh, places, like Greece, for example, and Cyprus and until the geopolitical issues are resolved. And Turkey has to obviously be involved with that. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a believer that the stakeholders in the Eastern Mediterranean should be able to share resources even before uh, uh, some of the uh, other sovereignty issues and boundary issues and so forth uh, are, are, are fully resolved. To give you an example, uh, show you how long I've been around. Over 20 years ago, I was mediating a dispute between Turkmenistan and Azerbaijan with respect to uh, some rocky many islands in the middle of the Caspian where there happened to be a lot of oil and gas. Well, they couldn't get that resolved. Finally, over 20 years later, they have resolved the, resolved the issues and will share in those resources. And it will be a shame if it takes another 20 years for these issues to be resolved in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, so I think that's something that really needs to be worked on. I think the United States has to play uh, a critically important role. 
uh, and I think can work with Europe and the U.S. can be an honest broker in resolving some of these issues. Um, so that's uh, pretty much where I see it at this point. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Morningstar. That's great. Uh, you raised a number of issues that I hope we can come back to. Uh, you talked about the Three Cs Initiative. Would love to get your thoughts if we have time about the EU taxonomy and financing of gas, and, and of course you mentioned Turkey as well. Again, if we have time, we'd love to come back to you and, and talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but let me turn next to uh, Professor Rufari, um, and I wanted to maybe just kind of step back a little bit and, and put this in a, in a broader context of a sort of profound energy transition that we are experiencing and one that we know is going to accelerate over the next two decades. You know, what are the energy security challenges that you see emerging from that transition and how can the region uh, be better prepared to deal with those energy security challenges? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you to you, Nikos, and to the organizer. Uh, the best thing I heard today has been uh, said by Mrs. Zduku uh, when she said that the best thing uh, is the uh, Greek island. And because we are dealing with uh, uh, the East Mediterranean, we have not to forget that dimension of the island, even the island which are south. It's crucial. And uh, I was starting to work on island in 1994 in the European Commission, and I'm very pleased to see that is coming finally. Uh, EastMet is, uh, is crucial uh, for uh, the, the future of the energy in the world to diversify the, uh, the resource. You have here a graph that I uh, will publish next week or two, in two weeks' time in, the, uh, in a peer review journal, the Physical Journal Plus. In, in, you see in red the, the fossil fuel. Uh, share and in green the uh, renewable uh, uh, and, and non-fossil fuel because nuclear is included. Uh, the heavy line is for the world and the light one is for EU. I think that we need a lot of faith to believe that this will be a real uh, a reality in 2050. A lot of faith because we have not invented the, the, the energy issues because of climate change. We have invented, or let's say, we have discovered the energy issues with the oil shock of the 70s. And since the 70s, we try to find solution. And today, the best solution that we have, wind and solar, represent 2.5% of the primary energy in, uh, in the EU. That means that uh, this has not to be forgot. It's nice that EU is going in one direction, Fair, we go, and the rest of the world. So we need to have a comprehensive view of what is going on in the world. Otherwise, we will mislead ourselves. Uh, this morning, Reuters opened uh, the, the, uh, the, the information with two news. One is the British uh, driver, which are furious because there is no more gasoline. Not because of lack of a gasoline, but because of the driver. Second one, I need to read the name because uh, it's impossible for me to memorize that. In the province in China, in Heilongjiang, Jilin, and Liaoning, Liaoning, sorry, there is no more energy, no coal. And the government hid the information, but it was too late. Reuters have uh, published the information. Why? Because we need, badly need, cheap and abundant energy. The EU has been founded with this statement in 1955, we need abundant and uh, cheap energy. And therefore, it's true that gas will decrease its share in Europe. But can you tell me how is it possible that uh, a few years ago, IEA published reports saying that we are in a golden age of gas, Mr. Juncker Commission published a paper saying more gas for Europe and more interconnection to the point that we create the project of common interest and bringing also uh, this uh, idea of the Southern Corridor that uh, Professor Antianakoulos presented. Why did we do that? 
because we need gas. And gas is available also in the eastern part of the Mediterranean Sea. And therefore, we have not to believe that this is something that we have to hide. No, it will remain a very important uh, thing for the future. To the point that last year, you remember the activi military activities of, the, of Turkey. Why those activities of Turkey around, around uh, 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 Cyprus? Because, uh, because clearly they want to have their share of this gas. Uh, it's calm for the time being, but last year it was very hot uh, with a, a lot of uh, uh, danger ahead. So this region will remain very important because also we have not to rely only on the Nordic supplier for gas in the EU. Nord Stream 2 will ensure gas supply in, Russia, in uh, Germany. Fair enough. Norway will send more gas to Poland uh, through Denmark and no to Poland with financing of the EU. Eh? But on the south, we need also gas. And it has been repeated many times here today. We need gas. And so if we, uh, if we have gas available uh, in the 11th Sea, why this gas should go to China? Why this gas should go to India or to Pakistan? Because uh, the, the, the issues uh, with Taliban in Afghanistan no, uh, close the dream to bring gas from uh, uh, Turkmenistan to India and Pakistan. It will be very difficult. So that means that those countries uh, in, in, in the Southeast uh, uh, Asia badly need gas, and this gas from the Egypt, from uh, Israel, might go there, and it will be a, a pity. So I think that uh, we have not to forget also that the most important thing will be the development of this region, which, of course, gas will go to the market uh, where the market wants. But it should remain in Israel, because from Israel it can go to Jordania and pacify the region. It can go to Lebanon, which badly needs energy, and it will be a form of peace that if gas will go to uh, Lebanon. And last but not least, uh, I think that uh, gas is one of the best energy for transportation, one of the clean energy for transportation. Right now, you know that the cruiser are operated with LNG. Why not the cruiser of, in the Medi Mediterranean Sea operate with LNG? It's, it's available and it's clean and it's cheap. Electrical car and hydrogen are very long term, to say the least. Gas can be used in this region also to bring a uh, ferry boat operated with clean and local energy. So I think that at the end, uh, when uh, the title is fantastic, we need to be optimistic. But uh, not just optimistic for Greece or for EU. We should be optimistic for the rest of the world because without energy, without cheap and abundant energy, there will be no peace in the world. It's why the East Met is crucial. Well, thank you so much for these comments, uh, Professor. You raised a number of things that I hope we have time to come back to. Uh, but let me turn now to Mr. Stipatos and, and talk a little bit about the exploration and exploitation of Greece's hydrocarbon potential. This has been a goal of successive administrations to try to both map and if we discover sizable resources, exploit those resources. Uh, I was wondering if you could share with us you know, what are the priorities for domestic exploration, exploitation, and how would those resources contribute to the country and the region's energy security? Thank you, thank you, Nico. Thank you for your question. Uh, let me start by thanking uh, myself as well, the organizing committee for their kind invitation. It's uh, an honor and a pleasure to be participating in this uh, panel of distinguished guests. And uh, with that being said, I think in order to answer the question and 
to help understand, uh, we need to put some perspectives. And what we are trying to, to do, we, we try to summarize it in a, in a threefold concept. I will use three words uh, as, uh, as uh, a sign of our priorities and immediate strategy. Uh, the first one is enabling. The second is clarity. And the third is cost. So I think it is, uh, I think most people, uh, and is widely accepted that uh, gas is the transition fuel. Before I say that, I should also clarify one more thing. Uh, since I represent uh, the hydrocarbons, it's not an objective to turn Greece into an anachronistic oil state. Uh, Greece has a clear plan, a clear objective to achieve an energy transition. And myself, uh, the board of directors, we are all aligned with this goal. So whatever I'm going to say is, and we truly believe it, it is aligned with the goal to deliver the, the, the energy transition. So, and this is why it becomes quite interesting when we talk about gas, the transition fuel. The transition fuel has a huge potential as an enabler for this transition. And the capacity or the potential of the country with potential own resources, uh, not least with the infrastructure it has, it makes it very, very important. How do we do that, of course? Well, as very well said, uh, Nico, the successive uh, governments that have been trying, and there have been uh, significant achievements in that direction, but I guess we can all agree that we have not achieved as much and we have not been as successful as we would have hoped. It is a reality that we have spent the last 10 years speculating about the size of the potential assets, the monetizable uh, assets. So what we think is a priority now is to get the clarity. Another word for the clarity, I guess it would be uh, actionable intelligence. Uh, we need to get the information. We need to understand uh, what is uh, the size of the price we are talking, of the potential price in order to be able to make informative decisions. And how do we do that? There are, in order to attain the clarity, we need to advance uh, the geological investigations that are underway, and we need to complete, complete the seismic studies. These are the means we have in order to understand uh, what we are dealing with. There have been uh, estimations that we could be uh, having a potential of, I don't know, 200, 300 billion. It is very important to answer that question so we can make the right decisions as we go forward. Uh, the interesting thing now is that this effort comes for no cost for the Hellenic Republic. The reason for this is because we have already attracted reputable investors. We have world-leading uh, companies. We have Total Energies. We have ExxonMobil. Uh, we have Hellenic Petroleum and Energian in the country. So what we see uh, as a priority for us is we need to allow them and we need to help them accelerate the work programs so we can get the information we need to make the decisions uh, that need to be made. And as I said, we do not have to spend money from the state to do that. So to bring now our priorities back into the energy security. When we talk about the gas, and we refer to it as the transition fuel, I would like also to, to put another parameter into it, which is the, I would say, it's not only the transition, but it's also the stabilizing factor of the new energy mix. And as a stabilizing factor, I guess we could easily uh, make the associating thought that, well, if you control it or if you don't have it, it could be a destabilizing factor. So, and I think this is an element of security that we need to think about yeah, as we go forward. Uh, the access to investments is not as easy, and, but the role of the gas, I think, becomes more important than ever before. So if we have domestic uh, resources that we can monetize, I guess it is obvious that this will help uh, satisfy part of the national uh, supply, 
but also diversify the energy sources. So it comes directly into securing our energy, uh, sec into securing our energy, energy supply. And it's very hard to say for how long would it take before we achieve uh, the desirable uh, transition. I don't know if it's gonna take 10 years, if it's gonna get, take 20, but the, the, the time it takes is considerable amount of time that we need to be very sensitive about when it comes to energy security. So, and another, another very important element in this discussion is that if we are able to monetize potential gas, natural gas resources in the country, we are not only uh, delivering uh, security uh, for Greece. Greece has uh, already built and is a, a very significant infrastructure. Infrastructure is already underway. Uh, Ambassador Payat uh, referred to some of the most important projects we have. We have the FSRU in Alexandropolis. We have the Revithus LNG terminal. Uh, we have interconnections with Bulgaria. Uh, we have the TAP pipeline and the recently announced uh, Greece uh, to North Macedonia interconnection. So. These are very important uh, infrastructure where if we can combine it with one additional source of natural gas, and that would be a domestic uh, source, then of course it is obvious that the benefit is not only for the country, but it has a regional dimension. So a lot of the neighboring countries will benefit from that. So I think moving forward, it is very important uh, to not forget and continue uh, the effort in, in monetizing the potential natural gas uh, uh, industry that we may have. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Tafatis, for those, for those comments. You raised a, a number of things that I hope we have a chance to come back to, uh, particularly one question that came to mind is really, we'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, the question of capital availability. Obviously, we've seen the global upstream sectors sort of you know struggle with equity markets and, and the availability of capital so we'd love to uh, if we have time to come back to you and hear your thoughts on how, the, how those trends might affect Greece but let me first turn to our final uh, panelist um, Mr. Blairesi and I wanted to um, talk a little bit more what's happening right now which is uh, gas prices are high uh, they're high in the US they're high in Europe they're high in Asia CO2 prices are high electricity prices are high uh, you know, how do you read this current moment uh, and the increase in, in energy prices across the board? And what does this tell us about energy security and the energy transition more broadly? Yeah, I actually have some slides. I think probably I should come up to the podium and get them. Are they, are they, okay, great. Um, okay, you're going to move the slides for them? Okay, I'm going to sit down. <laughs> so, next slide. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, just pass through this to the next slide. Just go through this. So, uh, you know, we, one of the things I think I can get at Nikos's question, um, and let's hold it here, uh, because I think, you know, I'm not here to tell you there's no Santa Claus. But I am here to tell you that this is an enormous challenge and that when you step back and look at this on a global scale, you really come to terms with how difficult this is. Uh, you know, our organization, we're, we're a public policy think tank, but we do occasionally do work for, for the government. We even have a project now with a series of defense planners. And they had a curious question for us. They said, you know, uh, we, we really don't know how these models work, you know, the energy model, not the climate models. So could you guys kind of pull them apart and explain to us why there's so much uncertainty and maybe give us a kind of transparent set of variables so we can understand. And we have another question. Um, we're not really interested on whether the, you know, the aspirational goals but as defense planners, we want to know how this is actually going to turn out, which is a much different question and a question we're not asking often enough. And so I think we start out, we have inadequate understanding of the scale and the scope of the challenge. 
we have really unwarranted optimism on the pace of technology adoption. And the non-OECD is not buying what the OECD is selling. I can tell you, and you see this now in the high gas prices. I'm going to get to Nico's question. You go to Indonesia, where there are 290 million people. It's not Denmark. I don't care that Denmark can go to net zero at 5 million people. 290 million people in Indonesia want air conditioners, and they're very sensitive to prices, very sensitive. You try to sell LNG in Indonesia, and they want to know, how high is that gas going to get? Because we're not giving up the coal. Because I have a population that needs air conditioners. Okay. So, and then, and I think actually, uh, this is a personal pet peeve, but economists who have abandoned a marginal analysis, many in this room, I suspect, right, and cost-benefit analysis, whatever happened to almost net zero? Where do we get to that? We have to get to net zero. The last 10 yards might be quite costly. And I think that it's true that Fatih Barol, and uh, I saw Dan Jurgen this morning say, well, you can't blame the high European gas prices on the energy transition because we don't have enough. Okay, but it's like the climate ate my homework, right? You can't, you can blame it on policy. We have moved for probably good reason. We have moved to a more price risk uh, complex when we shifted away from heavy base load, reliable base load, nuclear and coal to some extent, to gas. That comes with a higher risk. And policymakers are going to have to accept that uh, if the movement to net zero comes with a lot of turmoil in prices, the political consensus to sustain it is going to disappear, and it's going to disappear mm -hmm. very fast. President Biden is well aware of this. He is not proposing a carbon tax or an increase in gasoline taxes. Next slide. I, I want to get a chance. This, the energy transition is extremely hard. It's extremely hard. 80 to 90, depending on how much people in Tanzania, Tanzania, is, uh, Tanzania is using uh, biomass to cook food, it's fossil fuels generate 80 to 90 percent of the global primary energy consumption. And, it's, and that transition has taken 150 years to get where we are. It's not going to transition out of that quickly. Next slide. Okay, if you don't remember anything I talk about today, don't forget this particular slide. The U.S. has had an aggressive and uh, a costly and uh, uh, you know, a, a program to promote the development of solar and wind in the U.S. economy. And we've had very big, you go back to the 80s, the 90s, we've had very aggressive plans. Now, I'm not saying we can't do it going forward, but solar and wind today account for less than 4% of U.S. primary energy consumption. Next slide. Okay. The other thing that's very disturbing to me is that we are, if you look at the decision made by the Dutch court, the decision by the administration to halt uh, oil and gas development on federal lands, the uh, uh, Keystone Pipeline, which is a political thing, you know, but world liquids demand is reverting to trend. And we have experience with cutting supplies as a strategy to limit demand. We called it the drug war. It didn't work, and it's not going to work on cutting oil demand. We're going to have to, we're, we're not going to fix oil demand by cutting supply and undermining our energy not. security. Next slide. <clears throat> Here's something I don't think a lot of people are aware of. 80, over 80% 80 of world liquid demand growth between 2010 and 2020 was provided by the United States. I don't know what the number for, I asked the guys to send me the gas number, I haven't seen, I suspect it's very similar. Next slide. Okay, here is what we're talking about today. And I just, th these prices are very high, but they're high for a reason. They're not high because of the energy transition, I agree, but they're high because of policy. And that policy moved us to a more risky, uh, 
uh, fuel mix, and, we, and uh, you know, from a price point of view. Next slide. Okay. Next slide. I have to. Okay. Another issue that comes up a lot is, oh, the oil companies are holding stranded assets. There is nothing, and the, the most conservative people I know are people who make investment grade bond, buy long dated investment grade bonds. And if you look at the shape of these curves, there is absolutely nothing in the shape of these curves that suggests that these assets are stranded. In fact, uh, they are extremely stable, viewed as low risk assets. So when Carbon Tracker and the UN, everyone cranks out all this data, that the oil company should beware, they're holding stranded assets. Possibly, but there's nothing in the marketplace that says that. The market, the bondholders are saying, no, actually we think those assets are valuable and they're gonna be around a long time. Next slide. Now, <clears throat> this shows you uh, primary energy supply scenarios to 2050. Notice the huge variation going out, right? From DNV. We, we did a lot of work on this. I don't have time to go into this now, but the models, of course, are, they don't get better with more complexity. They're subject to uh, changes by short-term events. Anybody who's read, uh, you know, thinking fast, thinking slow, will understand all these phenomena. And so what we did is, I just, I just quickly point out, what we did is we broke down the ener energy forecast into four fundamental models, four fundamental variables, population, uh, income growth, fuel costs, or, you know, sort of capital and fuel costs, and income growth. When you do that, when you do that, you get a scenario going out to 2050 that looks very much like the IA stated policies. Uh, next, next, next slide. And so this is sort of what you get. So you get, so, so one of the things we did with this project is to, how much energy will the world need in 2050? Let, let's not focus too much on where they get it, but how much are they gonna demand? And they're gonna demand somewhere under, under the IEA stated energy policies and the work we did about 564 exajoules. One exajoule is about 450,000 barrels of oil a day equivalent. Next slide. Okay. So what we did is to get a handle on this is say, okay, let's make the OECD go to net zero and let's have some progress in the non-OECD. And what does that tell us about how much energy the world will need in 2050? And we were only able to do that to lower it from about 564 to 516. And you can see I mean, I'll make these slides available. You can see we did a very aggressive uh, you know, treatment in the OECD and, and some progress in the non-OECD. Next slide. Gonna... Now, the interesting thing also that I found in looking when we looked at the IEA net zero was, you know, we talk a lot about hydrogen and carbon, but bringing these technologies to scale is enormously difficult. I don't think... You know, you can get progress in Greece and islands, you can do progress, but when you step, step back and look at the whole world, say, okay, we're gonna take it to the scale. By the way, the IEA recognized this themselves. If you look at their study, you will see that of their total um, net zero kind of uh, calculations, very little comes from CCUS and hydrogen. Right? It comes from behavior adjustment and electrification. And that's where you get this removal. Next slide. Now, I think I'm almost done here, but one of the ways to kind of, kind of replicate or kind of get a kind of marker for technology advancement is to look at primary energy intensity. And we took all the major regions and we looked at the historical trends in energy intensity, and then we developed them out going forward as a way of kind of progressing technological advancement. When you do that, you know, you can look here that the historical rate is somewhere between 1.2, 1.8. What the IEA is saying 
is that we can double or triple this rate of development. It's an extremely unrealistic view. Yeah. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, we sort of, okay. I, I, I think I'll leave it right here. What I, oh, actually, I do want to end up with one slide because I, I don't want to give you all bad news, but uh, back, back one slide. Okay. Okay. So, one important thing to understand is the non OECD faces a different set of challenges than the OECD. And you can look at this picture here, not only on the what's happening in the supply side, but what's happening on the consumption side. And this, this is the real challenge. These are developing countries. They are not going to be interested in spending a lot of money. They have a population that is hungry for energy. And this is where you have a lot of the constraints. Okay, next slide. Okay, next slide. I don't want to. This shows you that I think we all understand this, but there's going to be no global transformation without the non OECD world. Okay. Next slide. Okay. So, how likely is a two speed transition? That's just actually what we're talking about, right? We're talking about the OECD making progress, but the non OECD doing. And what are the implications of that? And can we, can we live with that? Because you, you're going to see uh, modest to large declines in emissions, but you'll reduced economic growth, right? No decline in CO2, rising competitiveness on, under the non-OECD. I don't think this is a stable scenario. And I think we have to think about how we deal with that. Next slide. Okay. The two-speed energy also is gonna alter the geopolitical power outlook, right? OECD countries will take on more debt, create energy systems that are more vulnerable to malign actors. In fact, one of the things we really have to work on is when we move to this energy transition, our systems are going to be more brittle, particularly the power sector, right? It's like we put a big button on it, press here to cause problems. And you can see that already in California. I mean, it, it, this just, it boggles my mind, right? California has a very aggressive program to move to renewables, but you know, PG&E and the major, they're regulated utilities. They could have been told to build more resiliency in the power lines, to clean out the, the fire hazard. But there was so much virtue signaling going on, they forgot what they were supposed to do as part of their climate. You know, that, that there were these risks and they have to, I think it's happening now. Okay, next slide. So these are my unanswered questions for policymakers. Right. And I really think it's a great topic for all, all the folks here. And, and, and one of the questions is, uh, what's going to be the role of oil and gas in allied energy security? Are we, are we going to abandon oil and gas as a fundamental major? Um, what do we do about the constraints from um, net zero initiatives in China, India, and ASEAN? Resilience in the power system, something we're very interested in. And I think one of the things we have to come to terms with, is climate an existential threat or is it a manageable problem? By the way, if you read the IPCC, it is, a, for them, it's a manageable problem. It's the translation of those things to the press and policymakers, which have presented it as a existential threat. Okay, next slide. Uh, you need to look at the Sankey diagrams. I'm not going to spend any time with that. I want to, next slide. Okay, okay, next slide, move on. Okay, I want to leave on a high note here. Um, in the Permian Basin, there's been a very aggressive initiative to contain methane emissions. And the emergence of detection technology which has really gotten a lot better in the last four or five years, has been so, so effective in identifying super emitters that you can find large groups of companies operating the Permian Basin, which not only are they reducing their methane emissions, but they're making money on it. So I just wanted to leave everyone on this high note that we, we can do a lot, right? But, but we might, when we get on the gradient, we need to think about 
both the economic and the political consequences and have to do it in a way that we don't undermine our ultimate objective. So I'll stop there, Nikos. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for these wonderful comments. I am mindful of the time and I, uh, we, I would like to do another round, but for us to do another round, we each have to speak about 60 to 90 seconds. So that's the, the challenge to the, to the panel. Uh, very quick sort of reaction so that I can get one more uh, one more round out of out of all of you. So let's let's be uh, quick if we can. Ambassador, uh, you laid out so much. I did want to ask one thing that you mentioned on regional collaboration, particularly vis-a-vis -vis climate. You talked about gas. You talked about new energy technologies. Uh, what do you see as the agenda? You alluded to it in the three plus one framework, but maybe give us a little bit more of the agenda on climate change and dealing with climate change on a regional basis. Sure, Nico. I, I can do it quickly. And I, I want to say also on this question of rising LNG prices, I read with interest your recent manuscript on this as well. So I, I did do some homework. Um, I'll say, first of all, I mean, in terms of the regional dynamic, the most important thing is to follow through what we've already started. So these three big infrastructure projects, the Greece North Macedonia interconnector, the Alexandropoli FSRU, and the IGB, those need to be completed as a matter of priority. In Thessaloniki, a couple of weeks ago with Amchem, we were able to talk with some of my regional colleagues about the opportunities to extend that same kind of collaboration into alternatives and other sectors. To take a good example, Albania um, tends to be deficit in electricity during the wintertime because so much of their power comes from hydro. Um, that's the opposite of Greece, which has its highest electricity demand during the summer when it's hot. So there's a natural opportunity for shuttling back and forth, building this regional grid. It's also a challenge because Greece has a number of non-EU member state neighbors. So Greece, just like it does on transportation and other issues, can be a key facilitator as these Balkan countries in particular make the transition or begin making the transition to EU standards. There's a lot of natural complementarity because of the systems that are already there, also because of the huge work that the former Yugoslav states have to make in terms of, of cleaning up their energy economies. I would, also, I would also point to the leadership that Greece is already exercising in wind power. Um, Secretary General Sudoku talked about offshore, as did I. Um, this is obviously a frontier area for all of us. Greece is a natural laboratory for getting the regulatory structures right. Also for working out some of the, the NIMBY issues, because we're starting to see here in Greece a little bit of pushback from communities that are concerned about where the windmill should go. Um, Greece has done some very successful offshore isle, uninhabited island projects. Um, Agios Yorgos which is just off the, the coast of Attica here, is a really nice project which has been very successful, tied into the Attica grid. It will help supply the renewable electricity demand that's going to come in Athens. For instance, as Microsoft's new cloud infrastructure comes online, Microsoft is committed and is demanding that 100% of the power source for that now new cloud infrastructure be marginal gains on renewables. So there's an opportunity to take those kind of projects but also to figure out how do we work the community issues and, and where do you build this infrastructure in a way that doesn't get pushed back from the local stakeholders, which is essential in Greek democracy, just as it's essential in the United States. Well, thank you uh, so much, Ambassador, and also thank you for, uh, for uh, making your remarks brief, really appreciate it. Um, Ambassador Morningstar, let me turn to you. I hinted at this uh, when you concluded your first round, but. We'd love to get your thoughts maybe on the EU taxonomy. I mean, you talked about the Three Seas Initiative, uh, but obviously the question of finance and financing of gas under immense scrutiny. Some of your thoughts on what you're seeing coming out of Brussels these days. Right. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Nikos. Uh, with respect to the EU taxonomy and financing, uh, and, and I think this relates to the, some of the points that were made in the last presentation by Lou Pugliaresi, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, I felt a little bit, by the way, after listening to that, that I ought to go spend my remaining years in a cave or something. Uh, but, uh, uh, but obviously, you raise very, very important points. And I think the key, and this relates to your question, Nikos, is, okay, 
yeah, there are a lot of issues in reaching net zero. There are a lot of issues in getting to almost net zero. Uh, but uh, to get there, I think we do have to look at, uh, and the EU has to look at, you know, what are the costs uh, of what they're doing? Uh, what effect is it going to have from a social uh, and cultural standpoint? I think the way to look at gas, for example, is not to say we're not going to finance new gas ventures, uh, but to condition financing on the type of venture that it is, and setting landmarks as to what needs to be what needs to be a con what needs to be uh, part of uh, a project. Uh, Lou mentioned, you know, what's been been done on methane emissions. Well, those ought to be conditions uh, of financing. I think we have to recognize that gas is, you know, gas is going to be important, and that there are going to be other technologies that we have to do the research on to see if they're if they're going to work. Small module nuclear reactors. We can't look at nuclear from an ideological standpoint. We have to look at can we come up with. Uh, nuclear technologies that make sense and obviously create clean energy. You know, I could go on and on. So again, you know, I think the last presentation was very important, but we really have to focus on, okay, what are we going to do about it? Thank you so much. Really, really appreciate those comments. Uh, Professor Rufari, let me turn to you. you. You said a lot of things that I wanted to follow up on, but maybe I wanted to pick up on some of the things that you ended on, which is the use of gas in the transportation sector, particularly marine transportation. We'd love uh, if you could elaborate for, for a minute or two on what you see the potential there, You know what we could be doing to realize that potential for a region that just has so much maritime traffic, so important for the region. The marine transport is, uh, uh, is uh, depending on the, the bottom of the barrel. Heavy fuel, with contaminant, with sulfur, heavy metals. We need to change that. And uh, the only way to do that is to use more valuable oil product, but then it's expensive, or to move to natural gas. We should stop dreaming about both with hydrogen or both with uh, <laughs> electromobility. Eh? We, we, we are serious people here. <laughs> so uh, we, we need to shift to gas. And gas is already a reality in transportation. All the methane carriers crossing the world are operated with gas. The gas esca escaping from the uh, LNG are used in mo uh, gas engine produced by Rolls-Royce or uh, Varzilla. So it's a reality since nearly 35 years. And the, and the, uh, the cruiser have understood that this is a, a marketing issue because people are crossing the Mediterranean Sea with a polluting uh, boat. Uh, it's no more acceptable. So they, all the new cruiser are built with gas. So I think that... Uh, Maybe it will take time because uh, it's, uh, uh, we, we need to finance all that and uh, uh, the, the, the owner need to accept and legislation have to enter. But uh, for me, the future of the transportation in the Mediterranean Sea is with gas, LNG gas, which is available, abundant and local. Well, thank you so much. And, uh, and having spent some uh, time in the Greek islands this summer, you do appreciate the local air pollution uh, that comes from our reliance on the bottom of the barrel and the benefits that would come on, on uh, local air as well. Um, Mr. Stefanos, let me turn to you on the, on the question that I hinted earlier on. Uh, how worried are you about the global trends about capital availability and the pressures on you know, international oil companies and the broader EMP sector? Yes, well, Nikos, again, <laughs> to the point, uh, it is a problem. And it is, uh, it is a huge problem because it follows uh, a continuous uh, divestment uh, or the, the, the oil price uh, crisis that has happened before and the deinvestment that happened in, in the sector. So I think that's what we see right now with the, with the prices on natural gas. Uh, so for me, 
I'm also optimistic, though, because uh, the market will correct itself. Uh, as we go forward, it will become more and more understood that uh, in order to be successful in the energy transition, in order to do something about the climate now, it, it is important to do it now. We, we don't have time to wait. We need to start using more and more of the gas uh, wherever this is possible. And of course, we will not stop uh, developing the renewable energy sources. Uh, we have to go full ahead with that, but we also need to do the, the, the necessary corrective actions. And a part of the corrective actions is for the, for the financial sector to also come to terms with that reality. It's, it's, it's an, a reality, in my opinion, it's driven mainly by the engineering facts. Uh, so once we see that, I think we will, uh, we will stabilize again because uh, we, we need to be able to fund the necessary projects. It's, it's very simple. Uh, the, the bridge fuel, uh, the stabilizing element of the new energy mix is equally important it becomes a stability of the of the transition so i hope that we will start seeing that uh, happening uh, sooner rather than later because that would mean that uh, the the spikes in the prices uh, will last a bit uh, shorter well thank you thank you so much for those comments uh, last question and again really appreciate the brevity from all our speakers um uh, mr Bulliarci, you you talked about a two track transition and i just couldn't resist uh, because you broke it down between OECD and non-OECD. Mm -hmm. So I just can't help but wonder, is this region of ours uh, gonna be the fault line where on the one side, you're gonna have a much more accelerated transition and on the other side of the fault line, and I, I would love to hear where you draw the fault line and who's on one side and who's on the other, but is this what you would maybe expect to see in the Eastern Mediterranean? What does that mean? So, you know, in, in this, on this particular project, of course, we focused, it was Asia Pacific where you have these huge populations and this very rapid growth. Right? So yeah, you could have a fault line in the East Med. I mean, my, my view on the East Med is that it's, you know, you know when you look at the margin, you sh we should be doing everything we can to make sure they get enough gas to, so that the region remains as stable and as energy secure as possible. For peace. And if we need to kind of get a waiver on the more ridiculous climate stuff, well, we ought to do that because the security issues in the end are going to always, you know, they're going to surpass all these other issues. I, I, I really think, and the pricing issues. So that's sort of where I am. But I think the, the fundamental from the global transition, it's an Asia Pacific problem. Well, thank you for that. And uh, yeah. I, so happy that we were able to do one more round and really appreciate the brevity. Uh, you, and Nick. with that, I will thank uh, you for watching. Uh, thank everyone in the room for participating. And uh, that's it for me. And everyone enjoy the rest of your evening in Greece. I wish I could be there with you. Thank you. <laughs>